on with the show. Our next speaker today is going to be Professor Greg Niemeyer. He's a professor here at the Center for New Media. His creative work focuses on mediation between humans as individuals and humans as a collective through technological means and emphasizes playful responses to technology. His most recognized projects were Gravity at the Cooper Union in New York City, Pink at SF MoMA, Oxygen Flute with Chris Schaaf as SJMA, Organium at the Pacific Film Archive, Pink 2.0 in Paris, Organum Playtest, and Good Morning Flowers. The balance game also he did in London and in Cairo. The Black Cloud Project was funded by the MacArthur Foundation to provide an alternative reality game and a social network for sensing air quality and taking actions to benefit indoor air quality. The project has evolved into a startup company under the name of Aklima Inc. Currently as well, Greg Niemeyer is co-founder of the Social Apps Lab here in Berkeley. Greg Niemeyer. Thank you, Omaju. Beautiful introduction. I like the way you say air, indoor air quality. It's very clear. I like that. So I'm here today to talk about units of engagement. And I understand that the um, problem with uh, social entrepreneurship, that problem that motivates social entrepreneurship, is a sense of disengagement. That uh, certain sections of society sometimes feel disengaged in the processes that form society. And uh, I believe that uh, the theory, the idea of units of engagement might help us uh, understand that process more clearly. So uh, my first slide is going to be about explaining what a unit of engagement might be. And uh, this is uh, the example here. It's uh, uh, my children here, Medina and uh, Theo. And uh, Theo is having his third birthday. And uh, I'm serving a cake that I baked for Theo. And the cake is um, of, an, of, a, of a car. He likes red race cars, and so I made a car just like that for him, just like the one he likes for him uh, to eat. And um, clearly, what's going on here is I made something for my children because I love my children. My children mostly love candy, and so uh, the, uh, the, the cake becomes a unit of engagement. Although we're actually uh, focusing on the different things at this particular moment, it all hinges on the presence of the cake. Uh, we also see the little girl in the background right here. She's not disengaged. She's shy. Her father is comforting her, but she is uh, having her finger on her mouth. Why? Because she's already anticipating the taste of the cake. So, so she is currently disengaged, but the unit of engagement here, the cake and its various implications, um, draw her in, and that's exactly the point. Um, so... Another example that is, uh, okay, if we go back to this example here, I can't make much of a change. I can't move the needle much with the birthday cake. It's not that novel, right? We all know about birthday cakes. We know how they work. But they have certain features about them that are very significant. Um, what is more novel, perhaps, is to uh, worry about air quality and uh, indoor and outdoor air quality. And I want to go back to a project I started in 2001 with uh, Chris Chafe. This is the San Jose Museum of Modern Art. We did a project called... Uh, oxygen Flute, which was funded by Intel, and uh, the idea of Oxygen Flute was to create a greenhouse that is completely contained, a, a growth chamber as it were, and to have people walk in and out of the uh, growth chamber and to uh, inhale and exhale as people normally do, and in doing so, in, enter in a, a conversation with the plants inside about the carbon cycle. So the, uh, the carbon dioxide we release uh, fertilizes the plant's growth, the, uh, the plants uh, produce oxygen that we consume, so that's the carbon cycle. Um, there were uh, carbon dioxide monitors inside the chamber that were very precise in every breath of um, fresh air, that um, every, breath, every, breath, every, every quantity of carbon dioxide that was sequestered by the plants and every breath of um, carbon dioxide that was released by the uh, um, inhaling and exhaling humans uh, made a change in, in the data that we could measure, and that data was represented as sound. So when people walked into the uh, space, they heard sort of a a very meditative music that was composed by Chris Chafe. And right away when they would draw a single breath, 
the music would change and it would turn into sort of free jazz, depending on how much you hyperventilated. Um, the, point, the point of this, uh, of this uh, space was that it was separate from the rest of the gallery and it was also much smaller than the planet Earth, so people could directly see causation, cause and effect, um, that would engage them in the question of air quality um, directly and say, oh, I do this, that happens, the music changes. Unfortunately, this project had a few, uh, few challenges. Uh, one of them was that the pa panels were opaque, so people would go in there and do unusual things inside. And uh, that would, of course, be recorded by our carbon dioxide meter very precisely. Some people would go in and make out, some people would go in and smoke and do all sorts of things <coughs> they're not supposed to do in the museum. But we couldn't uh, see that really because it was a, a separate space. But this notion of separate Separation is very important for units of disengagement. We'll come back to that later. The other problem of oxygen flute was that it was very tall and very heavy, so um, you had to get it through specific routes to move it from one museum to the other because it couldn't fit under the highways, and, and it was this uh, nice model for talking about air quality, but it didn't move very well. It didn't transport very well. So we were looking for something slightly more movable uh, to carry on with this work because we thought it was very important to stick with the subject. Uh, one day I had lunch in, uh, in Berkeley and I came across this mural which is uh, integrating a thermostat into the mural scene and it's supposed to be a Mediterranean, perhaps a Turkish cafe and uh, uh, the, the, the thermostat that was mounted on the wall turned into what? A radio and uh, uh, in the cafe scene uh, the way it works here is also a, a unit of engagement because we have the radio that the lady is interested in and the gentleman is interested in the lady. Uh, but somehow the radio creates this point and marks this space, this sonic space where you can hang out and relax and enjoy yourself and, and perhaps socialize. Um, uh, the thermostat is very movable and I thought that was just about the right format for introducing uh, air quality sensors. So, um, as some of you know already, this uh, it was a, a project built here at Berkeley um, during my sabbatical year with MacArthur funding. Uh, we, could, um, we made a prototype here for a very small portable and networked air quality sensor that was um, uh, then networked uh, to a website called blackcloud.org where people could see how whatever they do in their daily lives all day long uh, uh, would affect data about themselves. And so this is also a unit of engagement that's much smaller and is not contained in the sense that um, you have to open a door to get in, but it is contained in the sense that you maybe have to log on to a website to see what it's doing. Um, and you also have it in a room that you're tracking. So you might have several of these in a house and, uh, or in a building and track different aspects of your house at different times. I had this one in my kitchen and I found out that when I bake cookies, I produce enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. And uh, way, at, way past the fact that the cookies have been eaten, the carbon dioxide still lingers in the house. So I was concerned about that. And I, I figured out that's cause and effect. That's, um, um, this qualitative research, but of course the important aspect is also with air quality to come to a quantitative research and so um, that'll uh, bring us to the next point here. Here we see um, a picture of uh, a second version of the sensor in Kathmandu in an uh, orphanage where children uh, get to explore technology and it was very important there. This picture was taken by uh, Gretzen who worked on the project, um, Eric Kaltman, and he show, to show the kids how the thing works to make them comfortable with it. So another aspect uh, that's important about units of engagement is whether you understand what, it, what the device does. If you can own it culturally and if you can own it materially and if you can own it intellectually, do you understand what the device does? And so we, we let the kids take it apart and we let them uh, uh, push buttons or break it maybe a little bit to see how the electricity flows, if it's dangerous or not, if it hurts to touch it, if the lights are hot or cold. Um, and uh, the, the sensor tracked a number of, of things that are easy, easily verifiable, like for example sound, there was a decibel meter in there, so they would yell at it and they were very happy when the lights all came on. <laughs> and, um, and this became a unit of engagement for several people uh, to, to communicate with the device. They also found out that methane drives one of the sensors, and so you can imagine what 12-year-old 12 12 -year boys do with methane and, and a sensor like that. So they maxed it out very quickly. Um, and and uh, the key part here is that there is an um, uh, uh, Ethernet port that uh, hooks this device up. Uh, so the kids in uh, the orphanage in Kathmandu are no longer isolated and uh, no longer engaged just in their own world, but they're now engaged in a um, series of uh, 
locations that also have sensors like that. So it creates a type of parity, this unit of engagement. Many people have it. It is an instance, right? And there's many instances of it around the world. And that creates a parity where um, kids in Kathmandu can compare air quality to, say, a corporate office in San Francisco, which they did. And they were like, well, we have more methane than you guys, so uh, we win. <laughs> and, and the nice thing about uh, Black Cloud, of course, was that um, the character um, is, uh, loves pollution. And so instead of having the narrative around pollution that's always very, very doomsday, very dark, very technical, there was a cheerful aspect to this because the monster is happy. The monster of pollution is very happy when we uh, pollute. It's like, oh man, I love this stuff. Bring me more, right? And of course, there's an irony there. You're not supposed to make the monster happy. In fact, you're supposed to ma make the monster go away like at Halloween where we try to chase the bad thing, things out of town. Um, but it had that kind of spirit that the, the, the Christ, the, the, the climate change issue became something we could address as a character and negotiate with and uh, maybe even chase out of town. Uh, so, so these are the five parameters we measured. Um, our carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds, light, noise, and humidity. And uh, temperature was in there as well, but it wasn't displayed. And uh, we... Uh, we have these lights that light up, these eyes are lights, LED lights that light up, depending on how, much, how many levels of uh, pollution there are. And then on the website, you can track these things very carefully. Uh, here's another slide showing the, the notion of parity. So you have several people here engaging with one device, several people over here engaging with the other device, but the two devices are on the same level. They're in the same framework of a unit of engagement that... Um, that creates parity between parties that normally wouldn't have anything to do with each other. So they're now not only engaged with their own environment, but with the environment of other people around the world. So here's a summary of uh, the five points uh, I was looking at earlier. Uh, one is ownership. So uh, for a unit of engagement to be successful, I want these five things to be in place. One, the ownership. Uh, we want to make sure that the device or the, the unit of um, engagement can be owned. So when I bake my own cake, that means something. It means I'm in charge of it. I own this thing. I can shape it. Maybe it doesn't turn out as beautiful as the, the Disney version would, but I can own it, I can control it, and I can give it to somebody as a genuine gift. Um, so there's a cultural and a material ownership there. Um, uh, two, transparency. We want to uh, have data that is correct. So on the... Um, on the birthday cake, I write the number three on because my son turns three and he recognizes the number three and he knows, oh, this is about me. So they see themselves reflected in the unit of engagement. They see themselves part of it. When I uh, make the black cloud data available, people see themselves in it. They see, oh, that's when I baked cookies. That's when I um, uh, started a fire. Uh, that's when I uh, cleaned the house. They see their own uh, lives reflected in the device. Uh, very important to maintain engagement. And uh, the, these types of reflections produce a record that ultimately people can use as evidence to make arguments that they normally couldn't make. So it gives them a language within which to articulate uh, their situation, their life experience, more clearly than they could before because they now have a device that produces a set of, uh, of, of information that they can use as evidence. And evidence is very powerful in, in giving people a voice. Uh, reputation. The unit of engagement should build not only the reputation of the individual <coughs> operating it, but also the uh, reputation of the collective uh, space that the uh, unit of engagement involves. So, for example, at a birthday party, it's not just me making the cake that's important at all. In fact, it's all the other people who are there and who make the event significant and maybe go home and say, gee, that was a tasty cake, um, that, that make the reputation of the collective uh, grow. So we had a good time as a result of being associated with this particular unit of engagement. Uh, scalability. Um, so how large can you make it and how many copies of it can you make? Can you make a birthday cake that feeds everyone? Yes, you can. Can you make one that's too small? Yes, not so good. So scale is important, right? And uh, instance, I can make one every year. I'm not going to run out of resources. I can afford to keep this going. Uh, same with the black cloud sensors. We have to figure out a device that we can produce and reproduce and spread around. If there's too few of them, it, it's never going to have the critical mass that it needs to, to, to be scalable and to have some kind of impact to, to become a, car, a, a part of a culture. Uh, and finally, separation. There has to be a ritual and a purpose that makes the device separate from everything else and makes it specific to a given purpose. 
And uh, uh, in the birthday cake, we have the ritual we know of. We sing happy birthday to you, right? And then at the end, somebody blows out the candles and then everybody eats the cake. It marks the beginning and the end of a ritual. It says, this has been a unit of engagement that is now over. It can't go on forever. It has to be a discrete unit that is separate from everything else we do in order to produce that sense of uh, awareness and special awareness uh, dedicated to a special piece of information. In the case of the birthday cake, it would be the child turned three. In the case of air quality, would be we now are studying just air quality and want to see what causes and effects we might discover. Um, so separation is very important, and it also comes from uh, game design notions of um, entering a game and exiting a game. And in game design, it's called the magic circle. So that kind of separation is the same there. Um, all of these elements together produce a type of performance, a type of performance that radiates outwards because it's not just what the unit of engagement does to everybody that's involved, but it's also an aspect of, there's also an aspect of the unit of engagement drawing attention to itself. So if we go back to the slide with the birthday, uh, we all sing happy birthday. Well, all my neighbors who live nearby will hear that we're singing that song and that cheer might, uh, may, might, might either annoy them or it might make them happy or might, they might think, oh, how sweet, there's a party going on. And, and so, so these units of engagement radiate outwards. And uh, likewise with air quality uh, measurements, if we have good evidence that shows um, what's happening if we do A, B, or C, that story can radiate outwards as a story. We can pass it along and say, uh, this is not isolated to this instance. It's going, uh, it's going to travel around in the world. Um, here's another project uh, just to illustrate these points a little bit more. This is called Tomato Quintet, and it's shown here at the National Art Museum of China in Beijing. It's a project with Chris Chafe as well. Here uh, we took the concept of the, bla of the, uh, the uh, oxygen flute and we built a, t a tent instead. <coughs> the tent is much easier to move than a, than a big steel structure. Inside the tent there are several of these vats of tomatoes. And these vats of tomatoes ha are green tomatoes that are ripening slowly. When they ripen they produce CO2, but when you exhale onto them they ripen even faster. And uh, so people go into that tent, it's a separate space, and they start interacting with this device. It's a strange ritual. They start breathing on it, and the moment they breathe on it, um, lights and samba music come up, and salsa music come up, and people can start dancing in the tent to the music <laughs> of ripening tomatoes. So it's like the tomatoes that are the quintet that's producing the sound that you now can dance to. And the tent radiates outwards in the sense that, um, this is the pentagon here, uh, it radiates outwards in the sense that you can see from the outside that something's happening in the tent. You might see shapes of people dancing, you might see, you might see lights uh, turning on and off rhythmically, and you might say, oh, I want to go in there too and see what's happening. So that's how that unit works, it brings people in again. Uh, here's a, a picture from... Uh, Madison Park, a community in, uh, in, in uh, Chinatown in Oakland uh, of seniors. Uh, and uh, here we, I want to point out that units of engagement and ownership, uh, that's not an easy process. It's actually very important uh, to learn how to, how to use a tool and own a tool. So there's a whole step there. So we can't expect units of engagement just to, to fall into our hands and we'll be ready to use them. There's a learning process and effort, a uh, process of acquiring how this thing works that is very important. And uh, so for this group, we made a, a project called Bingo Type. Uh, and uh, uh, the argument is that uh, typing is a fundamental skill for engagement in digital media. The digital divide leaves a lot of seniors um, out of the uh, digital equation. And we want to fight against that uh, with, with education, hopefully. And the unit of engagement here is Bingo, which the, uh, the people in that particular community really like to play. And uh, so in this case, you actually have to type in a bingo field the letters that show up and the faster you type, the more points you gain and the more your reputation grows. So as you can see here, after people do this for a while, their body language changes dramatically. They're totally engaged. They're now using uh, two hands or maybe even three hands to type. And uh, their, um, their, uh, their ability to interact with this device as a unit of engagement, the game, um, leverages the power of the computer for them so then they can use the uh, computer to, to travel beyond uh, their physical boundaries and interact beyond their physical boundaries. I have one more example from there. This is uh, at Noble Towers, the same uh, uh, location also run by E. Baltzi, um, uh, also for seniors in Oakland. And uh, they have a cooking club. It's five friends and they cook uh, every Friday, I believe. Is that, is that correct? And uh, so uh, 
the way they work, they initially engage uh, concerning just the food, right? So there's five people and they swap recipes and they work together. But then, of course, they have this quantity of food that they want to share and that then becomes the, the outward um, manifestation of this unit of engagement where we can participate and actually just eat the food. What's, what's not to like about eating the food? Well, uh, it doesn't cost us anything. It's a benefit for us. And for them, look at how proud they are. They're totally proud. They may, be, they may not meet that, uh, that many people during a day. I don't know. Um, but in this particular case, when they cook and they have their cooking club going, they, they cook with pride and with joy. And they're really um, fully enabled and fully engaged citizens. And that's exactly what social engagement is about. And uh, social entrepreneurship is about is uh, building that sense of engagement, that sense of um, pride in what you've accomplished, and that sense of self-efficacy. So... Um, that is um, how I see the units of engagement operating, and I hope that the five uh, aspects that we talked about help us understand better what may or may not work if we plan to uh, develop social entrepreneurship projects. I just want to acknowledge here, uh, these are the works that are involved, Oxygen Flute, Black Cloud, and uh, the many people who worked with me on this project, and I want to thank them all, because, uh, of course, collaboration itself is a wonderful unit of engagement where sometimes we uh, discover, sometimes we challenge, sometimes we learn, and uh, ultimately, we hope it radiates outward. Thank you very much.